Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 190 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I am your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. I am a speaker and two-time author. Our second book just came out recently from Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. That's available now, so go and pick up your copy today on Amazon. It makes the perfect stocking stuffer, I promise you. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring fraternity and sorority leaders together. Fun fact, it was Josh Arendi, owner and chief business development officer of Fired Up that really got me thinking about speaking in this industry. I hired Josh back when I was executive director of the fraternity to talk about recruitment during one of our mid-year leadership conferences. I remember it like it was yesterday, how Josh had the entire crowd of my fraternity brothers fixated on every single word he was about to say, and in a very humorous way, he asked them to step up and start executing like the best fraternity in the country that he knew they could be. That's when I knew it was time for me to start working with every fraternity, every sorority in the nation. But of course, my focus was always on risk management. Just as Josh believed that we as an industry could do better in terms of recruitment, I also knew that the fraternity and sorority community could do better in terms of risk management and preventing people from getting hurt. When I was setting up the business and talking to all the execs in Indianapolis, who gave me a place at his own home in Carmel, Indiana? It was Josh Arendi. We've both created amazing organizations that are built on human connection, where we capture the attention of the undergraduate students and provide the right resources to make them even better. And for that, I'm always going to be a big fan of Fired Up and Technify. So along those lines, today we have with us Colin Nelson Pinkston. Throughout his professional and volunteer experiences, Colin has worked with fraternity and sorority members on 60 campuses all across North America. In his most recent professional role, he served as the fraternity and sorority advisor at Suwannee, or the University of the South, advising 12 national and 10 local organizations. In January of 2021, Colin worked with Suwannee's Inter-Sorority Council to change its bid matching structure. And these changes led to nine out of 10 sororities to their largest fall to spring growth in the last three years. Additionally, under Colin's professional leadership, Sewanee saw their 2020 to 2021 academic year fall to spring growth for their entire community reach the largest levels in the last three years. So after that, Colin joined the Technify team as an account executive in June. He also, he's earned his BA in Spanish and International Studies from the University of Iowa, where he joined his fraternity, Lambda Chi Alpha. And following his undergraduate experience, Colin spent time working for his fraternity before attending grad school at SMU, where he earned his master's is higher education and administration. So welcome to the show, Colin. Mike, thanks for having me. I hope I can live up to that introduction. <laughs> hey, man, you are the man. I'm just telling the listeners all about the great stuff that you do. I mean, I've known this for years, but, you know, they need to know it. And, uh, you know, so I just want to make sure that they understand the chops that you have, which is quite substantial. So you have a lot to be proud of, Colin. What can I say? <laughs> I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah, it's it's. I was actually texting with Josh Rennie the other day, and he did some training for the staff at Lambda Chi when I worked there. And I, you know, we were just texting him like how much has changed in the seven and a half years since then. So yeah, I'm excited to be here and excited to be representing the uh, Fired Up and Technify team as well. Absolutely. Great people at uh, your organization. No question about it. Now, you chose the University of Iowa for your undergraduate experience. So I'm wondering, why was Iowa the right place for you? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to, I think it was sophomore year of high school. I was in, I think it was in an English class and they had us do like a college profile. And, you know, I was on the wrestling team. I was, I was by far the worst wrestler on the team, uh, but learned a lot. And Iowa was really known for wrestling. And so, you know, I was looking at schools and I was pretty dead set on Colorado. I'd visited Iowa State as well. And uh, that, it was a nice school, but, you know, it wasn't, it, it was top three of three. Um, but then, you know, Colorado Boulder was, I was like dead set on it. And then I think it was like a week before I had to figure out a decision. And we went to Iowa city and stepped onto the Pentecrest and it was a rainy, cloudy, cruddy day, but I still knew this was home. So um, really enjoyed both the other places, but yeah, Iowa city was the place for me. And 
absolutely loved it. Do not regret that for a second. Very nice. And there you join Lambda Chi Alpha. So what was special about this particular chapter that made you want to join this particular brotherhood? Yeah. So, I mean, for me coming in, you know, I didn't know a lot about fraternities. And so a lot of the IFC fraternities did summer scholarships. And so I applied for a bunch of those and with Lambda Chi, it just seemed, it just seemed like my people, you know, they were really authentic, really genuine. And, you know, it was also a chance to build an organization. I think subliminally, I didn't realize that I wanted to do that, but you know, I, there were about 25 guys when I joined and when I graduated, we were about 50. We had gone on to be most improved chapter in Lambda Chi going into my senior year. And that was more the guys that came in after me. I was less of a chapter officer, more behind the scenes, but yeah, it was just, you know, they wanted me for me and um, yeah, it, it was a fantastic experience. And it was again, you know, first day of school, freshman year and didn't look back, you know, I didn't realize how big of a role it would be. There's uh, one of my mentors, Paul, he does some work with Rise Productions and he it, it popped up on Facebook memories of, you know, like, you know, your fraternity time doesn't end when you're done with graduation. And I commented, you know, Paul, like, what else do you have in that crystal ball? Because I never would have thought that I would have made a career out of this. So yeah, I think it was a one decision that made a lot of future decisions a lot easier. 100%. I also, when I joined the fraternity, never in a million years thought I would make a career out of this. I mean, how blessed can I be for that one decision that just led to building businesses and everything else that comes after it? It's just amazing. And I love that they gave you that summer scholarship that they had available. I mean, what a great way to recruit people is based on academics and scholarship because Lambda Chi basically is saying, hey, this is important to us. And if this is important to you as well, come join us, right? Yeah. Well, and I loved how that was the campus culture, because when I went and worked with, you know, other schools or heard from other schools at, at conferences and, you know, I asked about their summer scholarship and they didn't do one. I was like, it just seems so basic. And now I realize, you know, monetary resources may not be the same for everybody. But yeah, I, I guess I was lucky to be part of a campus culture where that was the norm. Yeah. Particularly as an United States student. <laughs> Yeah, I listen, I wish that that was the standard in terms of campus culture all across the country. I think that's really what we need to be leading with. And I think for Gen Z, that's what's important to them. It's careers, jobs, networking, all of that stuff. So I think if we kind of hone in on that and a little bit less on the social piece, then I think maybe we're getting somewhere, right? We're now, you know, kind of leading with leadership and scholarship and jobs as opposed to, you know, how big our social calendar is, right? Um, so something certainly for us to think about. And after graduation, you went to work for your headquarters as an ELC. So tell our audience, what is an ELC? What did you learn from traveling around to all the different chapters? Yeah, so ELC stands for Educational Leadership Consultant. And so basically what that was, so we had a crew of about 12 of us and we traveled to a new chapter every three days during the academic year for the whole school year. So we would be based out of Indianapolis uh, during the summer and then December, January. But then other than that, we were on the road. So if we were visiting established chapters, we would meet with all 12 of the officers, with the seniors, with the new members, with the Greek advisor, and then do like an opening and closing meeting and presentation. So 17 hours of meeting crammed into about two and a half days. So, you know, th three days on a campus, give or take. And then on a Wednesday, you drive on a uh, Sunday, you drive and you get Saturdays off. And that, I mean, that was an amazing experience. Like I, you know, talking with other people who have done a role like that, like it was just a transformational experience. Um, you know, looking at that, like I traveled, my first year was like Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and starting up a new group in Prescott, Arizona. And some of those long drives, like I love to take road trips. And so I, there was one day where I think it was a Wednesday, I drove from Phoenix, Arizona at Arizona State down to UT San Antonio, which was about 11 or 12 hours and, and, you know, some pretty country through there, but just, you know, I love the, the chance to think and listen to podcasts or call people and um, really enjoyed that experience. And then the second year I worked there, I, I started up our group at Coastal Carolina and then traveled throughout North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, a little bit in Indiana, Missouri and Arkansas. And yeah, it was 
a fantastic experience. I actually did my master's capstone on skill development in fraternity consultants, which it was just, you know, I was looking in the research when I was doing my literature review and there was like no research on fraternity consultants, which I realize is a very niche um, group that's kind of changed now as, you know, overtime laws have changed and staffs have moved to a more coaching based model, which I think is better for fraternities and sororities and for the chapters, you know, it's not just three days where you have to put on your best face and then, you know, like let your hair down after those three days are over. Um, but what was interesting was, you know, I did that, that capstone and I had about 50 pages of data from survey responses, which was mind boggling to me. I thought, you know, I'd get maybe a few and, you know, have to struggle to put something together, but I actually had to split the study into two different studies essentially. So, um, what I found was that the top five skills gained by fraternity traveling consultants were communication, public speaking, professionalism, building relationships, and then teaching and facilitating and, you know, just super universal things. And, you know, like, I, I think having that information when I traveled would have been helpful because like there was one guy at our University of Texas chapter who he would have been a fantastic fraternity staff member, but he went on to work for an engineering firm, which totally makes sense. You know, it, it's, yeah, it made sense, but I was like, man, we lost it on somebody great. So um, I think that there's more and more work being done now to like publicize, you know, how, how working for your fraternity or sorority can benefit you. But um, I think that there's still a lot of room to grow in that area as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that was an experience of a lifetime. I certainly know that it was for me. Um, and so I agree with you on all five of those pieces. I hope that others that are listening right now will consider working for their fraternity or sorority headquarters because clearly it helped you. And then you were able to parlay that into a role with Fired Up and Technify, which I think really fits perfectly with some of the experiences you had as an ELC as well. Um, but before that, you got your Master of Education from SMU and you became the coordinator for FSL at the University of the South. Now, for those that don't know, that are not from Tennessee, this is a very unique FSL community, but tell us what makes this place so unique and what are you most proud of from your time at Sewanee? Yeah, I mean, that was a, an incredible job. And actually in my second year of my grad program at SMU, I was working full-time for a business honors program at UT Dallas and learned a ton there, like just a super dynamic institution. and. Um, then, yeah, I had a chance to, to pivot to Sewanee and, you know, it was, it was, it was definitely unique. Like I had visited there when I worked for Lambda Chi and, you know, had a really good experience of, you know, working with our chapter there, like, you know, building relationships with them. And so when I saw the opportunity, I was like, yeah, that's a pretty place to go like up on a mountaintop in Sewanee or excuse me, in Tennessee, like just, I think it's like 22,000 acres of like just wilderness. I was like, this could be really cool. Um, and so, you know, I remember when I interviewed, I, the interview was like a day and a half and I met with like the university president, you know, the police and assistant chief of police, athletic director, title nine, like all these people, they had this alumni Greek council that I met with in addition to the students, you know, student life folks. And it really seemed like an opportunity to build something and make an impact. And, you know, I think we certainly did that. You know, when I got there, uh, we had a 21 chapters. We were about 50 to 67 percent affiliated with a Greek organization, so about 1,200 out of 1,700 undergraduates. And the unique part, you know, we talk about the local organizations there. So there were 10 of the 21 were locals. So meaning that, you know, outside of Sewanee, there was no headquarters. There were no other chapters like Sewanee's you know, division of student life was essentially their headquarters. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the fraternity sorority community was in a local organization. So, you know, we had 10 sororities, um, eight of those were local. And the first one was started in 1977, which was a hundred years after the first fraternity was started in 1877. So for a long time, Sewanee was, you know, male only institution. And I think it's about 52 years since women were admitted. So, you know, shortly after women were admitted, sorority started. And it wasn't until I think 2003 that the first national sorority came onto campus. So for a long time, the locals were, were the only sororities and, and kind of on the opposite, the fraternities, there were 
um, 10 fraternities, nine fraternities, two of which were local. Uh, we ended up adding one um, co-ed fraternity, the first um, culturally based fraternity um, in Sewanee's history. And so they got started. And so that brought it up to 22 chapters. But yeah, that was, it was an interesting experience of like being, you know, the fraternity and sorority life office. Obviously I had some great teammates in, you know, student conduct in our campus activities and risk. Man I mean, it was a great place to build coalitions uh, because I would not have been able to do it alone. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, what I'm most proud of, I think the first one was being consistent. You know, when I interviewed, the students kind of talked about, you know, what was expected was over here and what was written down was over here. And so my goal was to kind of bridge the gap. And my first year, I started in October and from October until May, I had I heard about 93 um, organization conduct cases. So my role also involved hearing and adjudicating conduct cases, which what it provided an interesting dynamic of, you know, I'm here to help, but I also need to hold you accountable. And so that that presented its own set of challenges. But the second year, we dropped that down to about 27 cases for the year. And so I think that was partially a factor of students buying into like, let's be more consistent, like let's hold ourselves accountable and, you know, continue to get better and better. And then the pandemic, you know, arrives. So that kind of threw a wrench and all sorts of things as we all know. Uh, but I think some some other things that really came up that were, really good learning experiences for me and really, I think important moments were, um, so those local Greek organizations, the university assisted with, you know, obtaining their insurance. And so there had been a claim the year prior. And so the, the cost of insurance went from about $89 per member to about $360 per member. And some of these groups, their dues for the year were, you know, $200, not including internal financial aid. Uh, which was actually something that about 12 of the organizations did that they had scholarships for members that couldn't afford it. So inclusivity, making access to fraternities and sororities available to anyone was really important. And, and certainly just like any other campus, I'm sure there were issues around, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it didn't solve everything, but there was, there were more resources available there. And so what we did was, like actually similar to that presentation you gave at AFA, like walk them through how to become, you know, an incorporation in Tennessee, you know, what we brought in a law firm to kind of consult with them of how do they set these things up so that way, you know, the organizations can continue to exist and be insurable. And so that was, that was an incredible process of working with our legal counsel, working with our vice president for risk management, who, um, he has been a longtime champion for fraternities and sororities. So, um, Eric, I know he's at the University of Denver now, but he is, he's a great resource and um, that was, that was huge. So I think that, and then just finally, I, I, I started over the summer, I think I started this project management certificate from Google and, you know, I wanted to do it, kind of build my skill set. And one of the things I realized was that just based on the the function of me being a one person office and having to to kind of do a lot of everything with partners was I'd learned how to project manage, you know, of how can I empower other people? So whether that's the students and and going from the Greek advisor being the person that does a lot of the things to the students really leading and me empowering them. And so I think there's a lot to be proud of. And I actually just had a call yesterday with Donald, my um, successor there. And um, yeah, I think Swanee's in pretty good hands with Donald at the helm, um, in, in addition to the other leadership there. So yeah, a lot to be proud of and um, excited for what they're going to do next. Yeah, Donald's a great guy. He's a fraternity brother and his experience, I think, is really going to come in very handy for him at uh, Sewanee. So I wish him all the best and I know he's going to do great. There's no question about that. Um, and now you're working as an account executive, working with all my friends, PH friends at Fired Up. Tell us more about Fired Up. Tell us more about Technify and all the services and products that you offer to college students. Yeah, so Fired Up, I mean, we're, we're about 20 years old and to just put it really simply, we help fraternities and sororities grow. So that's been our focus and our goal. One of the things that really impressed me when I was interviewing here was that the, one of our goals is to serve 100% of the fraternity and sorority industry. And I love how bold that is because that's, 
you know, we're, we're not striving to mediocrity, just like fraternities and sororities. Should, we all take an oath to not strive for mediocrity. Like, I love that we are focused like that. And, I, and certainly we're not the only ones in the industry that want to serve as much of the industry as we can. Um, and I love that. So, I mean, for us, you know, we, we have a few like core beliefs of, I think the biggest is people join people. You know, when we talk about recruiting and growth, we can't recruit who we don't know. So we've got to go out there. We have to build relationships. And I think it's kind of a mindset shift of like, I feel like some organizations, some chapters, some members may think, okay, well, if we want new members, we need them to come to us. They need to, to find us. And, and that may have worked to some extent, but I think it's time to flip the script, you know, and, and there, there was a report that came out from NASPA and AFA. And I just want to read a quote from it here, but it was like, at no other point in the collegiate experience would we advise students that strong relationships can or should only be forged over a several day period. So like they, from that, and that's page 81 of this, this NASPA document um, about excellence and fraternity for life recommendations. But they talk about, you know, no other time do we say only build relationships for one week or only build relationships if people come up to you. And so I think it's just, why, why are we doing it here? So I think it's re-examining our focus on growth and, and really going out to, to get more people in our pipeline. And so that's another thing too, is, you know, we believe and we know that quantity drives quality. I'm sure you've heard it before. I heard it when I was, you know, a consultant, when I was working at a campus as a volunteer, you know, well, this year we went for quality over quantity. And that may very well be the case, but if you have a bigger pool to choose from, you can choose more better people. So I think that you can have both quality and quantity. Well, I know you can have both quality and quantity in the same, in the same conversation. And, you know, I, you know, we have a couple different areas that we work with in terms of like the actual, what we do. So we do training, whether that's in person or virtual, we've kind of rolled out a digital classroom offering for pretty much every sector of the fraternity and sorority experience. So we have a, you know, culturally based fraternity and sorority classroom where, you know, people can learn to be certified recruiters. Same thing for, you know, our inner fraternity council, um, Panhellenic council. We have a COB Academy. We have an advisor's classroom where it kind of talks about how can they support and coach within a growth system, as well as like working with today's college student, because, even for me, when I graduated in 2014, so much has changed in the student experience and who our students are. There's just a lot to learn. And I think that those resources, you know, you talked about being able to reach more people, being scalable with this podcast. It's kind of similar of like, we can get that into more hands than going and speaking. We also do consultations and coaching. So, you know, that's sometimes I get pulled into that with, you know, different headquarters or different chapters or, you know, councils and really coaching them on how can they build and maintain a growth system. And that's a big thing too, is that we, we want people to have, we know people need a growth system. So we have a system for collecting dues, for educating members, hopefully. Um, and, you know, we have systems for how we operate. Why do we not have one for growth? You know, Josh, you mentioned Josh Rennie. That was a question he asked me. And I was like, that's a good question. Like, why, why don't we, you know, because when I go to Starbucks, you know, if there's six people working and no one is good at making drinks, I don't just walk out because I know my drink is going to suck. Like I know that they have a system to make that drink consistently. They've got someone to run the register, to run the drive through, to keep the place clean, to make the drink, everything like that. It's good. It's consistent because there's that system. It's got to be the same thing with growth. And I think that's where our technology comes in. So Chapter Builder is, is one of the products I work really closely with. And so for anyone not familiar, that's a customer relationship management software designed for fraternity and sorority recruiting. So it talks about, you know, getting a names list of who we know, who we need to build relationships with, building pipelines, using forms to get those leads to come in automatically. Um, there are also premium versions for emailing, texting, calling, there's an event feature that just launched. And so, you know, we do have the paid versions, but I do want to highlight, we have a free version that anybody can make use of, and you can start to build your growth system with that. You can do that with 10 people. 
you have access to forms to build a pipeline with like an Instagram form. You've got access to add people to your lead list and you've got access to really kind of get that foundation in place. And then we also have um, campus director, which is for recruitment management for like the councils. So um, typically we see Panhellenic or IFC recruitment on here, but we also see some NPHC councils, some MGC, some other councils as well. And then we have my vote, which is designed for chapters to vote on who they are going to bring into their organization. So it's it's all things that work within a growth system. So it's it's been incredible working here. Like I love our team. We are so talented. It's kind of crazy to think like, wow, I fit in with all these people here. Like this is really cool. So I love working for Fired Up and Technify, and um, I really believe in what we're doing. Yeah, I don't blame you. I think they're a great group. And, and I've thought that for many, many, many years. I think that's great. Now, there are a lot of chapters out there that are listening right now where the chapter has become stagnant, or maybe they have decreasing chapter size as they're kind of emerging through this pandemic over the last couple of years. So what's your recruitment advice to these chapters who've been struggling during the pandemic? I think the first thing is looking at your growth system. And if you don't have one, that's a good place to start of building a growth system. And we have resources for that, but within everyone has a growth system, whether you know it or not, and whether it's working or not, that those are different, different questions, but I think it's looking at how do we grow? So are we waiting for people to come find us? You know, if our, if we have a house, are we waiting for them to come and knock on our door? If we don't have a house, are we waiting for them to find out where we live and like come talk to us and say, hey, I want to join your organization? Because some people may do that, but if we only rely on that, we're missing out on a ton of people. And so, you know, looking at, I think also looking at, you know, is it one person that's bringing people into our organization? Is it one person that is growing our organization? You know, if we're an organization of two or we're an organization of 200, I think it's important that everyone has a role in recruiting. And when I say recruiting, I really just mean making friends, introducing those friends to your friends who are in your chapter, you know? And so again, it goes back to that people joint people and we can't recruit who we don't know. So, you know, also something to look at too is, you know, is the experience we offer, is it the same as what they're actually going to, see and feel and do once they're in our organization because i've done membership reviews where new members asked you know is this a normal part of the fraternity experience and for those not familiar membership review is basically the last step of how do we save this chapter rather than closing it and so getting it to a point where people know that what you are telling them they're going to see is what they're actually going to see and so, you know, again, I, talk, I think the biggest and best place to start is just go make friends. We've all made friends before. And if not, you can start now. It's, it's pretty easy. Um, and so I think, again, introduce those friends that you make to your current friends and then get rid of that mindset that they need to come to us. And if you want free resources, go to fireedup.com slash free. And we have a ton of stuff. We've got a YouTube channel. There's so much stuff that you can use there. Great tips, great resources, as always. The other thing that I've been thinking about is retention, because that seems to be another big issue during the pandemic. The chapters that I'm talking to have more members that are leaving through the back door, as opposed to how many they're gaining in the front door during recruitment. So how do we engage and retain our current membership within fraternity and sorority life? I think it goes back to how we bring people in. You know, if all we offered was social outlet, then it's not a surprise that people are leaving our organizations now that that is no longer an option or now that that is restricted. And so I think it's, it's about becoming multifaceted. You know, we talked about, you know, the studies about Generation Z wanting professional development, wanting to network, wanting to give back and become a better version of themselves. So I think it's finding ways to do that. And it's, that's going to look different for every chapter on every campus, but I think being multifaceted to where people want to give their time, talent, and treasure to the organization in the short term and the long term. I like that a lot. And I think you're absolutely right. The ones that are struggling with uh, retention typically was all about the social events prior to the pandemic. And as soon as that shut down, they had no other pull. They had no other way to keep their members happy. Um, and so some of the smaller national organizations um, and others seem to be doing really well during the pandemic because 
you know, the events, the big events was not something they relied on for either recruitment or retention. Um, and so they seem to thrive during the pandemic. So I think we really do have to kind of look at fraternity again um, and see, you know, is this still working in this new environment that we're working in or not and make changes. Um, so I like everything that you had to say. I think that's really good. Um, you also, the team at Fired Up, you guys are always looking at research and data for the FSL community. So I'm wondering, do you have any recent interesting research or studies that today's undergraduates should be paying attention to? So not a study per se, but one thing I've noticed in the past couple months is that, you know, not just Fired Up, but we as an industry are starting to realize that we need to look at the pre-membership experience and be more intentional about that rather than trying to, to have an intervention after people join. Obviously, if things happen, we need to intervene as they happen. And you know that's just part of the nature of the work. But if we can be proactive by looking at how people are brought into our organization, what experience they have. And one thing I loved, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Qualtrics and their experience management resources, but I read this article and actually did a presentation on it at our Winter Growth Summit about like customer journey mapping. And so that was actually something I did at Suwanee of looking at the, the experience of you know new members, leaders in, in chapters and councils, and then just general members too. But looking at it for your specific situation of what are like the on stage of like what do we plan for what do we want them to experience and then what are the off stage experiences of what are the things that they're going to experience whether we plan for it or not whether that's something like orientation coming into college like fraternity for life may not be a part of that or whether that's social events organizations host or whether that's social media that people see like just kind of looking at what is that experience that we intend and that may happen, but also what is that experience that maybe we're not planning for? And so I think that there's more intentionality there. And also last week at AFA, I noticed in conversations with headquarters staff and even campus staff, there's more of a desire for peer-to-peer -peer sharing of how to be successful, how to grow successfully. Because what I've noticed as I'm pulling chapter builder data is that there are some chapters that do it really well and some chapters that they haven't leveraged the tool to their to its fullest and we can see that in terms of how many people they're contacting and how many people are on their lead list and just anecdotally i don't have specific numbers but every group that has a phone number set up in chapter builder for those that have a paid account have exponentially more leads and they've contacted way more so we're talking close to probably 60 to 80 percent of their leads that they've contacted and probably uh, for those that have a phone number and, and those that haven't set one up, they've got probably 10 to 20 that they've contacted. So that's, that's huge in and of itself. So not studies, but just kind of things that I've noticed. Those are great points. I love the peer to peer education that you're talking about. I see a lot of the conferences in the industry starting to move that way to basically say, how do we get students talking to students to share some of these best practices? So I like where you're going where there. That's uh, that is very cool. Now, as you know, I am a very big foodie and uh, happen to live in the Nashville area. I know you spend a lot of time in the Chattanooga area of Tennessee. So I'm wondering, what's your favorite restaurant to visit these days? Yeah, it's hard to narrow it down to one. I'll give you a top three for Chattanooga. I've, I've been here about three years. And so I think my first one would be Hi-Fi Clyde's. It's kind of a bar and grill kind of feel, kind of a, not, not like I don't consider Chattanooga a college town. I may be wrong in that assessment, but um, it's kind of got a college bar restaurant feel, but they've got these amazing brisket nachos. And I can't have dairy. So they have vegan cheese that's actually decent. Uh, they've got some great wings, great drinks. So that's worth a look. Um, if you're looking for something more fancy, same part of town, it's called Aaliyah. It's this Italian fancy place that like, while it's fancy, it's not like as expensive as I would have thought, but they had this like fantastic grilled romaine. It's like a salad, but it tasted like a cheeseburger. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and then probably my third one would be Alex Thai. Um, it's obviously a Thai place, but they've got a lot of different food there. And there's this, this one dish, it's called the Malai noodle. It is top notch to die for. So um, honorable mention would also be the burger at Main Street Meats. Wow, those are some good suggestions. I like Alex Thai. I will see you there in Chattanooga. We're gonna meet up for some lunch and uh, try out some of those noodles. <laughs> Let's do that. 
<laughs> that sounds great. So if our listeners are having recruitment and or retention issues, what is the easiest way for them to contact you and get the help that they need? Yeah, I think the best way would just be to email me. Um, so my email is just Colin at technify.com. So that's C O L I N at technify T E C H N I P H I.com. Or you can hit me up on Instagram. My, my, uh, account name, tag, whatever you call it, is just CNP on the gram. Uh, real original there. But uh, yeah, happy to help. And, and Mike, thank you for having me on here. This has been a lot of fun to chat with you. And I was a little nervous coming on, but it's been great. You've been a great host. And I, you know, heck, after reaching, you know, 190 episodes, you've, you've got some practice here and got some great resources. So thanks for including me in that. Of course, it's my pleasure. That's what I tell everybody. I said, listen, I've done it almost 200 times now. You're in the best hands that you possibly can be in. So nothing is going to happen to you. You're going to do just great. And Colin, you absolutely knocked it out of the park as usual. It's been a lot of fun getting to know you at Suwanee and certainly over at Fired Up and Technify. You're also in great hands there. So I have no worries whatsoever. You are exactly in the right place doing exactly what God put you on this earth to do. So I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. I, that means a lot. <laughs> of course, of course. All right. So we'll stay in touch to all of our listeners. We hope that you enjoyed this session uh, talking a little bit about recruitment and retention. If you liked it, please like it on social media. Please share it with other fraternity and sorority members on your campus. And we'll see you soon on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie. Thanks so much and bye for now. <laughs>